Good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, October 13th. Uh, it's a Tuesday, actually, because of the holiday. And we're also starting a little bit earlier because of some items on our agenda. So <clears throat> tonight, I think what we're going to do is we've got a number of guests for our COVID update uh, topic. So we're going to bump that up to the top and take that one first, I think. So um, do you want me to start with you, Caitlin, or Lori? Which one would you like to... Caitlin, go for it. Oh, thanks, Lori. <laughs> um, I, I do have Cheryl Volpe should be um, joining us. Okay. She's not here yet. Do you want to wait a few minutes then? Uh, I can... Sure. I can text her also to find out. Okay. Because um, we, um, we can do our minutes and um, grab another topic or two. And then if we need to switch back. So why don't we do that then? Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. So why don't we go over uh, our, our minutes for last week's meeting? I can, I, I heard you only because I can hear you from the other room, Tom, but I'm not getting your audio. Hmm. And I don't, it's funny because I don't see the mute thing. You want me to go in and take a look at See if I can figure out what's going yeah. on. Yeah. That, yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's last great. week there was town clerk update with some schools update, both very very beneficial. Municipal energy contracts, pretty straightforward, and then COVID. So. Nope. I would make a motion on those minutes and wait to okay. hear from Tom. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yep, okay. He seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Yeah, it's odd because it doesn't look like he's muted, but we can't hear him. <laughs> it's quiet rage. <laughs> right? And there's tech support. <laughs> and there's tech support, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I'll give him a minute to do that just to see because because <clears throat> we could hear him earlier. No? Nope. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> yeah, I still can't hear you. Maybe log off and re-log back onto the meeting. I don't want to launch into the other stuff until we know he can right. connect. <clears throat> Bear with us folks for a moment. You just hop him back on? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Everybody enjoying the beautiful weather otherwise? Good stuff. Yeah. We do need the rain though, which is good. So, yep. So, we are still down. So, and our, our foliage is a little muted and about a week or so behind its peak usually this time of year. So, David, you here? Hey, hey, I can hear you now. Perfect. I don't see you yet, but I, I can see your name on there. Yeah, I'll be there in a second. All right. Sorry. We're in. All right, excellent. So, sorry, did you did I miss the vote on the minutes? Did that yep. already happen? Okay. Yeah, t yeah. Scott first. Uh, Made the motion and then Tom seconded and then three to zero in favor. Oh, there we go. Excellent. 
Not yet. Not yet. Uh, I mean, tell us here we are. Did the person um, you were waiting for get on, Caitlin, yet? Not yet? Okay. <clears throat> All righty. So then why don't we hop off to our wastewater treatment plant level control system project. Um, can I suggest maybe doing the appointment to the Community Pathways Committee? Because I think uh, Rich Brenda. You wait for Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Just Not in case a there problem. Are questions. Yep. No, it makes sense. <clears throat> um, all right. So we've got an appointment for Scott Smith to the Community Pathways Committee. <clears throat> and thanks for volunteering for that. Motion. Uh, I'll second. All right. All those in favor of appointing Scott Smith to the Community Pathways Committee? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks. And welcome, Scott. I'll let him know. <laughs> uh, there you go. <clears throat> Good thing you let him know after we voted. Yeah. Oh, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Do you want to do the finance update, Jeff? How about that? Uh, no. No. I think the, the accountant's <laughs> coming on. Uh, okay. I can, we, we, can, we can do the COVID stuff. Do you want to start? I, I, okay. I spoke with Cheryl. I, I spoke with her about an hour ago. Okay. So, um, so we did have two clusters over the last four weeks, as everybody knows. <laughs> the frantic phone calls and emails, um, yep. which popped us up into red, the red zone category, red category. Um, and uh, they were, the two clusters were UMass students um and they were uh tested all tested at umass i believe and um i think what uh and umass has been um ha handling the cases what i think we need to do um and we're we're very um appreciative for um the work that umass is doing with the um, case, the handling of the cases, um, we are having, um, we, what we do need is a little more um, communication regarding information about who has been moved back onto campus uh, for quarantine and who is staying behind as far as close contact, you know, are the close contacts staying behind? Are the positive cases on moved back onto campus only? Um, and kind of how are those decisions made? Are they asked? Are they told? <laughs> and, um, you know, it, 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 yes. Yeah. Tom's got a question. Can, can, I'd just like to back up. <clears throat> so, who do you contact at the university and how do you contact them? So do you have a direct contact point? I do not. Um, the la I tried to get in contact. So can, I see can Anne. Ask why? Can, I, can um, I ask why? The yeah. Um, so, um, hi, Anne. <laughs> I, um, when I tried to contact you through um, the health, public, the public health, um, your voicemail was, your office was shut down, like your personal office. So then I went to public health and they actually had me leaving messages with the nursing staff. Um, and so like, kind of like as if I had symptoms um, <laughs> of something. So they said, no, leave a message there and she'll get back to you. And so that's where I, I was left messages for you last week because we were in that red zone and I had questions for you. Um, because Maven wasn't there's, and we'll discuss this at another time. Cause this really isn't, it, it's okay. Um, oh, terrific. I get a number. Um, but when we spoke with uh, the Maven people today about how um, the universities are acknowledging cases and when there's off campus living, the acknowledgements um, are coming through 
but then there are confirmed cases and then there are suspect cases and two numbers are getting generated and they're not being merged and they're not being merged fully. And then what's not happening necessarily, and we're gonna confirm this tomorrow with the state is whether close contacts are being brought over into the MAVEN system when the confirmed case, case numbers and the generated suspect case numbers are, I, I don't want it emerged, but <laughs> um, so that's something that we need to deal with, um, with uh, Ms. Becker and I think the school, um, probably Jeff. Oh, good. You raised your hand. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering, maybe we can just pause for a second and, and have Ann kind of just give an over. I think what would be helpful is everybody gets a kind of a better overview of kind of what our current response is for, for cases, especially if they're students that, that live off campus from that perspective. Perfect. I'll pass it over to Ann in a second. But just as you know, you know, we, we have one of the largest asymptomatic testing centers here in the state. So as part of the testing that we've been able to do here, you know, we've expanded that uh, for the off-campus students. Um, and that's been a key measure here in our public health practices here for the fall semester. So, you know, obviously with the students that, you know, most of the students, um, if not all of them that are been testing positive, don't have any face-to-face -face classes or are not living on campus. And the university has, um, you know, expanded our public health capabilities to support those students who are living and residing and, you know, Amherst, Sunderland, Hadley, et cetera. So, from that perspective of having the students coming in and testing positive, and then we are getting the results in real time from that perspective. I'll pass it over to Ann now and you'll see why it takes another day or two to get into MAVEN because we're responding before MAVEN is even receiving it. Sure. I see what Tony just had a question there. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it would be helpful if we introduced ourselves. I, I don't know if this is, um, you know, something for the citizens of Sunderland, you know, uh, would like to know who we are from the university. So it makes some sense yeah. to everybody. Um, but we can certainly do that if that's okay. I would appreciate that. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you. Sure. I, I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Tony Maroulis. I'm Executive Director of External Relations and University Events. Um, I work closely with uh, your town administrator, Jeff Kravitz, um, both in his time when he was uh, in Amherst as the economic development director um, and now. And we're also golf playing partners, but uh, we won't talk about that, especially after my game this <laughs> last week. Um, so uh, Jeff, Jeff's asked us to come here today uh, to, you know, both talk about uh, Sunderland's, dis you know, distinction uh, in the red category. Uh, through the state's COVID map and, um, you know, the cluster of cases that have been associated uh, from the university. Um, so thanks for having us here. We'll try to answer as much as we can. Um, Jeff's already jumped into a few things, but I'll um, pass it on to Nancy who can introduce herself and then we'll go to Jeff and Anne as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And thank you for having us here tonight. I'm Nancy Buffon. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations at UMass and um, worked closely with Jeff while he was in Amherst as well, although I don't play golf, so I, I won't comment on that at all. I'll pass it off to uh, Ann and Jeff to introduce themselves too. Good evening, Hi, everyone. everyone. Oh, sorry. You go, go ahead, Jeff. No, ladies, no, Ann, please. <laughs> no. Okay, I, I'm Ann Becker. I'm the um, Public Health Director and Director of the Public Health Promotion Center um, and also faculty at UMass and, and public in the College of Nursing. Good evening, uh, Jeff Hescock, Executive Director of Environmental Health and Safety and Emergency Management, and I co-direct the Public Health Promotion Center with Ann. All right, thank you. Thanks for introducing yourselves. <clears throat> but I don't know, Ann, to go back for what I was piggybacking, I'm not sure if that works. Yep. Sure. So, um, it's nice to meet you, Caitlin, and um, unfortunately, this is the first time we're meeting, which is not usually ideal, but I do have been, um, uh, I'm, it's unfortunate, Cheryl Volk does have my phone number, I know uh, I have hers, and so um, she, she could have called or given you the phone number at any time. Uh, 
as you can see, it's sort of an open book. So feel free to call when you have questions. Some of those uh, details we can work out on a case by case basis with our staff that we have here when we're working with the students when you want to know what if where they are. Um, but to go on a broader stroke, um, when a student tests positive um, and uh, through either the Broad or University Health Services, we um, start a case investigation immediately with them. And so it would be a bit sooner than what you would see in the MAVEN system um, because there's a, a delay because we get it directly from the laboratory. Um, rather than waiting for the laboratory to report to the state system, the state system to report back to us. So we're directly from the laboratory. We initiate a case investigation um, and we gather all the data and start working um, with the case and the contacts. Um, and then we will put them uh, at, as we can into the MAVEN system. Um, all students are offered uh, isolation and quarantine space as appropriate if they're contact on our campus facilities. We don't have any uh, capability to force that or require that on them, but we definitely offer it to them. And certainly some take it um, as they, you know, we try to explain and we use education and support as our big tools. Um, to help them through this process um, as they are going through both isolation and quarantine. Um, and so, and then they re receive um, daily uh, phone calls from our public health promotion team staff. Daily? Most of the time daily. During the, the um, surge that we had, it got to be every other day, but for the most part, it was daily. Um, you know, a case by case basis um, it is uh, sounds good, but it that's that wouldn't be good for us. Um, what we would need is some type of policy on um, when our residents are no longer in Sunderland and they're in isolation or quarantine on campus. We would need to know that. Um, whether they designated by an address or by a um, initials or even their maven number yeah that's um, fine you know because it's it, we get quite you know only because it's our community you know like so that would we if we could somehow get together and get like a policy um because just i think that's important to know that if we have a positive case that's no longer in our community right. then we would know what we were tracking um, I understand completely the difference between how you receive your cases, you know, you get the positive first and then the state gets a positive and puts in. That's the difference between what I was saying, the suspect number and the confirmed number. Um, you know, um, when you enter into, before a confirmed case comes from the state and you enter a case into a MAVEN, you're entering a suspect into MAVEN, correct? Um, we enter into a red cap system and then wait for the case to come up into MAVEN, which many of our students now have case numbers because we've been testing them so frequently. So we, it's getting a little quicker in right. our ability because we'll f fill it in a little bit sooner. So, but all of this, yeah, we're happy to talk it out with you Great. And, and figure that out. That's fine. Why don't we just schedule a, a, a time? Great. Great. Because I think that's great. And I'm, I'm so thankful for your um, your team and the fact that you're handling all the UMass cases and following them. I just want to be able to look, be able to pull them up and close them out so that if we, because we are responsible for our MAVEN cases. So when they come up under Sunderland, because their addresses are in Sunderland, they're Sunderland residents and we are the Sunderland Board of Health. And even though they're UMass students, they're residents of Sunderland. So I, I, trust me, we are such a small town <laughs> and you guys are such a, 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 a big help for us being able to follow and do the contact tracing. Um, we just need to have some type of communication so that we know that the 
contacts have been followed, that everything has been done, so that when we close out the case, we're not just saying, yeah, UMass did it. Because I, I need to be able to say, I know that UMass did it, like if because I'm swearing that it's done. Mm -hmm. And if yeah, we're I happy to co co coordinate with you. You, you know, I'm not I, saying you'd ever forget a kid or something would slide through the cracks, but you know, I I have a I'm I'm an attorney by trade, and if I'm swearing to something and I'm checking something off that it's done, I just want to know, be able to look at it and say, I yeah, it's done. Yeah, so that's why. That's the only reason. I'm not. I. Totally no problem. Beyond Kevin. grateful for you guys. <laughs> Trust me, and I want to be as helpful as possible, and I want to be as transparent as possible, and work with you guys. Fabulous. Thank you. And you know, I, it's unfortunate Cheryl didn't connect us sooner so that we could have done that. So, yeah. Well, let's Absolutely. just plan a Absolutely. meeting in the near future. Okay, That's great. Reasons. And thank you again for all of your help and your testing and everything else, because we would not have been able to do this. You're welcome. Yep. So as far as that, um, I think that as far as the UMass stuff, it's really just, um, you know, for our citizens, I've, I've received several phone calls. Um, we've received several emails in through our general system to the town administrator. After we got our designation, people got very upset, um, wanting to know what's going on. And um, I tried to explain that this is, this is going to happen. Um, we are a college town, and we have an influx of students. And uh, I've let them all know that um, you know, we're in very good cooperation with the University of Massachusetts. They have policies and rules that the students are following and to let them know that when we've contacted the students they've actually been beyond cooperative <laughs> they've been yes ma'am <laughs> no ma'am you know they've been even um, extremely helpful so um, whatever the education that's been happening from UMass to their students has gotten through because when our uh, Board of Health has contacted them, they've been extremely cooperative. And I'm letting the citizens that are calling me concerned, um, I'm letting them know that and know that the UMass students are uh, following the guidelines that, uh, well, I can't tell. I don't know if they're following through, but they are being, as cooperative or more cooperative than our some of our general citizens when I'm following up with them. So your education has done something. So thanks a lot for that. Um, do you guys have any questions for me uh, since I'm here? Oh, can I can I ask you a question, Caitlin? Sure. So so who's responsible for acknowledging the Maven? The Maven report. The, well, it could either be uh, Steve Ball, who is our inspector. He has Maven and um, access, but really our public health nurse. Um, she is the COVID, we, I've, we have her on a contract yep. to handle our COVID cases. And so she is supposed to go in and acknowledge the cases, UMass has, uh, I didn't, I was taking notes, but uh, UMass is handling uh, all UMass generated cases. However, we still are responsible for Sunderland residents. So when you're a UMass case with a Sunderland resident, it, it's like a dual it's responsibility. Overlap. Yep. So we still have to follow the case. And Typically the what case. a lot of small towns do, Hadley and Amherst and our other surrounding partners is, 
uh, there's a mechanism within Maven to share the case and we could just fill it out and they then the town can see everything that we're doing. So there's uh, lots of options. Perfect. And again, yeah. Caitlin and, and Cheryl and I can just meet and, and make sure that uh, they're getting what they need. Because there's a lot of questions I have, like say the UMass student has a family who follows the spouse, the child, if the child's in school, at the elementary school, that kind of stuff. So we have lots of, you know, questions. Yeah, it sounds like that meeting will be very helpful. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll come with a nice big list of questions. So. Oh, it'll, yeah. But it's <laughs> but nothing, it's nothing, I don't think nurse, you know, Becker or uh, Cheryl Volpe have not dealt with before. Right. COVID is a new <laughs> virus, but public health nursing is not new. <laughs> right. Just a matter of tightening up some procedures and yeah. doing some of that. So that's good. I mean, I am kind of stepping on Ann's toes there, but I'm assuming it's just because we have a new virus doesn't mean the procedures are necessarily brand new. All right. So, so could someone um, explain the, the poly the procedure when when a when a UMass student um, test positive, can you go and can you go through the process to let our let our residents know what what actually happens after that? Sure, start at the beginning, and you know first is that the students who are UMass and off campus are welcome to come in for twice a week testing at our asymptomatic. Uh, testing uh, center and or if they have symptoms then they can go to our university health services um, and get really uh, same day uh, care at either location. Our results from both places are usually um, within about 24 maybe 36 hours is, a, is the longest time it takes for us to get our results and so we have some really great systems built in um, that we stood up this past summer and into the fall. Um, once we get a positive result, the laboratories call me directly and we reach out to the student and we start the case investigation using the same um, fields in Maven um, and we enter it into um, our own system so that we can track them um, and that our um, our public health students can also do those daily calls that I talked about. So they do these wellness calls for us. Um, they are offered to stay on campus in our isolation, or if they are contact of the student, then they can uh, more than welcome to come onto campus to stay in our uh, quarantine space. Um, so we use all of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidelines. So the same sort of things. Um, that 10 days for isolation is a minimum, 14 days for quarantine from the last date of exposure, and we follow them and then we'll discharge them once that period has gone. Once you, as you know, once you test positive, then um, you'll have a little break from testing for a while, and then we'll bring them back into the testing routine um, once that's over with. Generally, they are, as you said, thank you, Caitlin, they are really great great um, community members and really do want to cooperate. We work really hard to educate them on what to do. We provide them isolation and quarantine instructions that'll have um, how to cope emotionally, how to cope with their academics and keep up to date with those um, resources for that sort of thing, even resources on how to stay in shape while they're in their own room and then resources how to you know do instacart or other food scarcity one of the reasons we do these uh, wellness calls is to make sure they have all the supplies they need um, food they need and they're not having to go out and into the community um, unnecessarily so certainly if they're you know have any of those sorts of issues that's why we like to bring them on the campus when they're on campus we provide them with uh, four meals a day for my dining and all of those services are free to them. So if, if you do encounter any of these students, please let them know 
that, uh, you know, they don't have to pay to come into our isolation and quarantine for that period of time. They don't have to pay for their meals or their um, isolation and quarantine space. May we ask a question? Hello? Yes. Um, is there any reason that you're not making off-campus students who live in the towns surrounding UMass have the testing be mandatory instead of voluntary? Yeah, I, I can answer that. So as part of our outreach with all of the campuses, we are directing the students to come in from that perspective. So um, as you probably see, you know, we have the COVID dashboard that um, shares all of the, the data in terms of deaths, testing and confirmed cases. And um, it's only gone up each week for the amount of individuals that have been getting tested. So, um, so we've been really pleased with the off-campus population that uh, has been coming in and getting tested. Are they obligated to come in though? Well, they're directed to come in from that perspective. And, you know, as the university, we're continuing to, to support all of them from that perspective. So, you know, the, you know, as we continue to, you know, with all the students that are living off campus in, in the area, I was saying is we are seeing more and more students come in and we've been pleased with that. But you're not enforcing them to come in. Correct. That, that was actually, so I, I do, I have Jeff and Tony and all, I do have some suggestions from our residents. Um, pretty, one is that you have mandatory 8 a.m. attendance classes. So if you have a class, you make sure it's done at, <laughs> scheduled at 8 a.m. and there's attendance. The second is they want the, all the package stores in the area to be closed uh, because they, they've noticed that, um, unfortunately, that um, it used to be they, they saw house parties before on Friday and Saturdays nights. Now they're seeing house parties on every day of the week. And that, that's been a huge, um, a huge concern. And I, I haven't asked the chief about um, additional calls that he's making, but um, it seems like there's a little more activity than we've ever experienced uh, in the past. Um, so that 8, 8 a.m. class kind of sounds interesting to me. Um, if I could jump in, the, the 8 a.m. class, I don't think that we have any control over it in this particular meeting. I think we'll talk to uh, <laughs> our friends in the provost's office and see what they can do to schedule things. Um, that might be a little bit of a logistical uh, hurdle, however. As far as the package stores, um, you know, I think that one, one of the things, you know, uh, I, I will have to say that, you know, this is a municipal issue more than anything else, right? I mean, I, I think that um, I'm not exactly sure how that is governed, you know, with regard to... Um, regard to the state. I mean, the state made a decision at the beginning of COVID to keep package stores open. Um, I think that package stores have done quite well during COVID and that's also <laughs> yes, with the adult population. I'm pretty sure uh, we learned during prohibition what happens. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> sure. And, and I, I think that's probably true, Caitlin, but I also will say that, you know, um, I, I don't see the, re the police reports from Sunderland, but I do from Amherst and the numbers that we have received in terms of the, uh, the call volume has decreased this year. Uh, I, I would also say that, you know, based upon the call volume and the police actions, um, we did a little uh, analysis today, you know, the average gathering is well within what the recommended um, state guidelines are, which is under 25. We recommend to our students to keep anything to really their pod and under 10. And what we've seen in Amherst is a, you know, an average of 8.5 people at any gathering that the police have any action at. I'm not saying that that's 100% across the board, but I also don't think compliance, even with our, you know, um, with our adult population, has been 100% across the board. So, um, one big effort that we make on a regular basis is education. Um, I have talked to uh, to Jeff Kravitz, and you know, about the the discussion about doing what we do in Amherst, which are knock and talks. Um, we have not yet, you know, figured that out, but we're going to meet this week hopefully with the chief as well to discuss what that might look like. And that door-to-door -door educational piece um, has been really helpful in, uh, in Amherst. And, and, you know, I think it's something that we can certainly <clears throat> pilot in Shootsbury. I mean, um, Sunderland as well. I'm sorry, not in Shootsbury because Shootsbury doesn't really have any students. Um, and I'm not going up there to knock on doors too far apart, actually. 
So you go to the doors of apartment complexes, is that higher end, uh, is that what you're doing? Uh, usually with the knock and talks, the apartment complexes are a little bit different. We work with our off-campus student services, which uh, work with the uh, property managers to de deliver messages. Sometimes we go door to door though. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, depending upon the layout. Uh, single family homes though, uh, you know, we're able to, uh, you know, go through neighborhoods where there's high density and, and make those uh, knocks. Um, I think we have something of a sense of, of where students are living in Sunderland in a way that we never have had before, but it's not certainly not complete. I think, you know, working with, uh, with Jeff and with Eric, I think we can get a, you know, good sense of uh, where we should concentrate our efforts. <clears throat> the, the, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. The, yeah. I, I, I guess, but my concern is I've never had, I've never taken as many calls as I have and talk to as many people that are of concern. And, 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 and look, I, I've been a selectman for a few years um, and, and we've had a lot of issues, override and everything. But, you know, you, putting us in a red category um, and, and, it, and it's solely, so what our residents have been striving to do for since March, since March and we had become, we were doing pretty well. And, but it, it, it affects the people, how they think about going to local stores. I, 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 I know people that won't go to green, won't go to Amherst to a grocery store that are now going to Greenfield. Never, they have never done that. I also know, I also know my, my first telephone call to anybody else was to the superintendent of schools because we belong to a regional school district. And, and all of a sudden, how do, how do I know now Sunderland's a red, how's that gonna affect the education of our 600 plus um, students at Frontier and in our, in our elementary school? Um, we, we, we're, we're working a hybrid situation right now. And I am a little concerned because I, we had kind of thought that all, all UMass students that tested positive were going on campus or that, and I think a lot of people thought everyone at UMass was taking classes were getting tested. And there was a, uh, an understanding or a feeling that because that was happening, that it was kind of like UMass was a separate entity altogether. And now what we've heard tonight is that UMass is really part of our community. And, and that may change how we do things. And, and not just us, but the education component. And t Tony, I'm so concerned because I've heard from many parents and family, fr family friends, um, people on the street corner, um, that a, a kindergartner cannot learn on Zoom. Uh, and, and now because of 10 UMass students, we may have to change what we're doing at our elementary school to go to fully remote. And somebody has to, somebody has to impart that knowledge to, oh yeah, well, we're staying within the 10. Yeah, but if you go to one party today with 10, you go to another party next week or tomorrow with 10 and, and Wednesday another 10, that's not what we're, we're, we're trying to say. Somebody has to do something. Well, here's a couple things, Tom, and I, and I think that, that th these are all great points. And as a resident of the area and, you know, who is affected also by uh, case numbers, uh, you know, I share the concern of those parents. That said, I think that this cluster could have happened outside of our student body. And that 10 would have still put Sunderland in, in, in the uh, red category. Absolutely. The university, however, is doing one thing that the rest of the community cannot do, which is to surveil those that are within um, our student body, our staff, um, and our faculty mm -hmm. to uh, ensure, you know, or to at least, you know, identify positive tests and then to do the contact tracing, the, the necessary quarantine and isolation. What, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that, you know, we're only testing our students and only finding the positives there. COVID is likely, you know, within the community as well, which is something that, you know, also has to be, you know, kind of noted, right? So the, the concern and the vigilance still has to happen on the part of the community as well as our students. 
Um, I think that, you know, Jeff can talk a little bit more because he, he knows this much better than I do. You know, some of the limitations with regard to, um, you know, the color coded system that the state uses. Um, but, uh, you know, the uh, positivity rate, uh, you know, has been, I think, somewhat low. Now in Sunderland, it's different, right? Your population is much less than Amherst, but if we were looking at ourselves as a collective, you know, with, with, the, with the, the county or within the Amherst area, for example, um, you know, I think that our numbers, uh, you know, compared to our testing are, are quite in a pretty good line. Jeff, do you want to take that and talk about that a little bit more? Put it into yeah, some deep... So, you know, um... The, the Commonwealth's map that does kind of the red, yellow, green, and gray, you know, is based on kind of cumulative cases and per the 100,000 population, not based on positivity rate. So this is something we, we closely monitor because Sunderland's right now is over the last two weeks was the point, point 0.71 and the Commonwealth's positivity rate is 1.02. So it's still below the Commonwealth's uh, positivity rate. Um, obviously, it's been higher in the last week because of, of those students testing positive. Um, but the identification of that cluster um, is key because, you know, you, you know, this isn't 11 one person cases, you know, every person is an individual and every case is one person, but the contact trace and everything coming up closely together to get those folks isolated in the close contacts quarantine produces further spread. So personally, the Commonwealth's map you know, I mean, there's no borders of a pandemic, right? You know, I mean, and everything that we're facing here, uh, people cross town cities to get to work every day. And as part of that, you know, with the positivity rate there, um, still below the Commonwealth. So obviously we want it even much below that, but I, I would say that map also, I, I think is, isn't something that, you know, like I was saying is that there's no borders of a pandemic. So people, crossing back and forth. So I think with those numbers, you know, I mean, it's that sheer number is where we're at versus the positivity rate that is something that we really look at based on the amount of tests that are doing because, you know, the last two weeks to 1500 tests, most of them are from the UMass Amherst Asymptomatic Testing Center. And that's a way in which we can prevent further, um, further infection going around. Anybody have any? Nope, I, will, go I would just say that, you know, I am one of the strong believers that there's probably a lot more positive cases walking around than we know because of, you know, not a lot of people are tested. Right. Um, respectfully, Tony, you know, you said that those positive cases could have come from anywhere. They didn't. You know, they came from the cluster of UMass students. We have had one, we, we've had one case since May until UMass opened. Okay, and that's when our cases started going up. And we've had testing. We've had people going into the hospitals. We've had, you know, our, um, a lot of our population actually works at UMass, so they've been tested. A lot of our population works in private schools, they've been tested. Um, a lot of our population, so, you know, works in hospitals, they've been tested. So we have been, had a pop, our population of 36 to 3,800 have been tested. Um, so it's not like we've had no testing. We're not an island here of completely non-testing. So, um, you know, respectfully, our, our positive cases, I believe, are coming from UMass kids. That's, that's, Caitlin, that may be true, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying that they're not. And I mean, I think that the evidence bears that out. What I'm trying to suggest is that it's not necessarily something where students are acting irresponsibly. What it, what it does mean is that, you know, when we have, uh, when students are living in places where there's density, there's a greater chance of spread. And I, and I think that, you know, given the conditions in Sunderland, you know, with, uh, you know, there are complex apartment complexes in Sunderland, more than, you know, a lot of rentals and single family homes, there is the chance for spread to happen, even if students are doing their best to comply. 
That's all I'm saying. I'm certainly not suggesting that they're not, that they're not our students. I'm happy that we're finding our students through our testing pool. Absolutely. And that's the one thing that, you know, I think is of service to the community in general. Well, and, and so the that, fact that's that your saying. students are educated and your students are being cooperative. I yeah. think what Tom was saying though, and answers that I couldn't answer for him being the chair of the board of health were, well, are the students being pulled back onto campus? What are the, for quarantine? What are the strategies? What are their, um, you know, how do they make their decisions? Um, what is, what's in that agreement that they sign that they have to get tested or they have to go back onto campus? What, and I couldn't answer any of those questions. You know, I know that, you know, Jeff and Tony, we had one, I was at one meeting and I, I'm, I'm sure there were others that I wasn't at. I'm also working and I'm also trying to keep my kids in school. Um, and without duct taping them to chairs, I don't know how to keep them at their damn computers. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm spreading myself thin. But what I'm trying to do is, is trying to figure out how and and I'm not I'm not saying UMass is our only problem. Um, you know, we've got stores where I've got people not always wearing their masks. I've got <laughs> restaurants. I've got other things to deal with too. But since I've got you here, um, well, you know, why don't I suggest this, Caitlin? Because I, I think that you know you're absolutely right, and I'm not I'm not you know and and I and we all are spread thin. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of questions that the community has and, and very little way of, you know, other than like pouring through our website, it's really difficult, you know, to kind of really um, know everything that's going on. And it, it's quite extensive, you know, we could spend, um, and I know you have a full agenda here, but I, I think we can spend a, a whole lot of time going through that. Um, we do have a meeting that's coming up that's being scheduled. I, I, I don't know if you're in that one. I hope you are. Um, where, you know, we can go over those details and I think we can come back and report again to the board, you know, at a time that, that where there might be even more, um, you know, time to talk about this, um, you know, what, what some of those steps are where, where you can feel um, more confident. But, you know, I think that, um, as Anne was saying before, you know, her, um, you know, sh she and Cheryl have, you know, a, a, a working relationship and has working relationships with, with, the, with the public health folks in, in Hadley and in Amherst as well. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of work and a lot of coordination. Uh, I think some of the partnership is a little bit new between, uh, between us and, and, and you all. And, and this is sure. something that we could, you know, uh, in the midst of a pandemic, working that out is sometimes a little bit tricky, but, right. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that these are things that, you know, we can discuss and make sure that this is less opaque um, but, you know, I think rest assured, we're, we're committed to the health and safety of the community. I mean, it's not just our students, but we have staff that live in this area. Um, you know, all of us on this call that, that from UMass, um, except for Jeff, he lives far away, um, are, you know, part of this community. And, and, and you know, um, uh, so, you know, the, the health and safety is of paramount importance. Um, and so we're all taking it seriously. And, and I think we, we want to work with you all as well. I think that meeting uh, that you're talking about is Thursday. That's the one, Jeff, right? right? Yeah, and I think yeah. I think that'll be a good forum to to get some of those things, you know, ironed out. Can I leave UMass with one more question, um, or something to think about? Um, the students have signed on campus and off campus have signed something that says they're going to behave. For the people who are off campus who haven't behaved and are asymptomatic. What is their incentive to come in and be tested? So one of the things that we don't lead with is uh, d the, the message of uh, punitive action first, right? I mean, it's education and trying to get students mm -hmm. in. We have to have them as partners um, and that's good public health, right? That, that goes, you know, I think that we've had that demonstrated, you know, going back to the AIDS crisis, particularly, you know, how important good public health was and good public health messaging and getting the public to be a part of the solution. Our students, generally speaking, are. Um, I think it's been noted just recently in the, uh, in the press, you know, the, the number of conduct cases that have occurred this semester. So conduct always occurs. It's not only about COVID, those contact cases. I want to make, make sure that that's clear. 
but uh, we are, you know, uh, where there is a need for discipline, those, those uh, you know, disciplinary action is taken, right? And so, for example, you know, I, I referenced police reports in Amherst. If there's a noise complaint and there's a citation, then that, you know, that gets referred to the Dean of Students Office and that is handled. Um, so, but, but again, that's not how we lead. Um, we want to lead with education. We want uh, our students to, you know, uh, be a part of a, a, a you know, um, a culture of compliance. Uh, and for the most part, I think that that's what we're seeing both in testing, in the response to contact tracing, and then, um, you know, for the most part in, in terms of behavior as well. We have, you know, if, if we have about 6,000 students that are living in this area, um, you know, about, and I'm talking about the area at large, um, those students are doing a heck of a job to um, do their part. Um, and we'll continue to work to educate them and, you know, and work with them throughout the rest of the semester and beyond. I think there's no shortage of people who aren't following procedures in the non-student body out there too, as anybody who's <laughs> walked through a store and witnessed people yeah. um, sure. complaining about masks and things. So you're right. It, Education is the, the biggest wave of uh, trying to get that under control. And we do understand that the students are still a valued part of our community. They purchase things, they, they come to our fairs and our, you know, they're valued residents. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Okay, Absolutely. so I, I just yeah. want to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. No, and, and we appreciate that. I, I don't think that, that we feel that, you know, in, the, in this um, discussion tonight. Um, I just think that there's a lot of questions out there and we're more than happy to help answer them. You know, when I get called at eight o'clock at night from the superintendent to find out if the, what does the Board of Health recommend about closing our schools down, you know, because we have 11 mm -hmm. cases in two weeks, this is a huge thing. You know, this is serious for us. <laughs> not, I, I'm not saying you guys aren't taking it serious, trust me, but this is huge. Right, we've got a lot of knock-on effects from that. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Do we, anybody have any other questions at all? Um, and then from our folks here in town, well, I, for first I'd like to thank all of you guys from UMass for coming out. We appreciate your time and everything. Um, thank you. Does anybody in our, among our group here have any other questions or comments about uh, on our COVID update at all before we hop on to uh, any other topics? All right. Uh, oh, go ahead. Wait a minute. Okay. We, I was promised I was supposed to talk about Halloween. Oh, yes. The only th I can just tell you what I've thought about and I discussed with the Board of Health is I, I in my opinion, uh, legally, um, I, I can't shut down private citizens' behavior. Um, so my recommendation is that no town, look, it, it's, there's a virus going around. I do not think that it's advisable to have group activities where people go up to people's doors and take candy. That being said, I cannot legislate private behavior as far as what people are going to be doing. Um, all I can say is I would recommend that the town not hold any public events, that the library not have any public events. Uh, but if a parent is going to have their child go out door to door, I, I can't. That, I think that is a personal decision. Right. Um, you know, we talked to the Board of Health. We agreed on that. That's up to... Um, you know, I mean, I don't think that the police officers necessarily need to be out um, with the children. That's up, you know, but as far as uh, cancel, quote unquote, canceling Halloween, I don't see how that can be enforced. What do you do, run around after the kids? Uh, I, I don't, so I'm not sure how that works. So if I could ask, Mr. Chair? Yes. Caitlin, the Board of Health has the has the capacity to declare a health emergency, right? Right. I, get the, I understand the enforcement part, but maybe the few weeks of communicating could help minimize some of that well, activity I, you're concerned about. I don't think, well, 
I don't think it's an issue we should. I think it's a parenting issue. I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I, you, you know, Caitlin, it, I, 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 Scott and I, Scott and I, I, and I don't think, and David was part of the board. We, we already tried, uh, we dealt with Halloween once already. Yeah. And uh, I, to tell you the truth, I mean, I, I would just make a recommendation. Um, residents, I, I mean, it's it's pretty much customary. If you don't want people coming to your door, you don't turn on your light. Turn your light off. Exactly. I, I just don't, I right. mean, I, I don't think that this is, a, I, yeah. I, I, and we I talked about that, it at the I Board would... of Health. I mean, I think that what we're recommending is that the town does not sponsor any Halloween events. Right. Um, there's nothing official because I, we're in the middle of a pandemic where there should be no crowds. There should be nothing. I, I, just, yeah, I just, I agree. That I mean, I can, we I can make a recommendation to parents. Why would you have them go up to a stranger's house and be within six feet of a stranger and take candy from them? Right. In a pandemic because your kid's going to whine. I, I, I don't know. That's, but that's, that's the board of health recommendation. Um, I know other towns are canceling. I, I just don't understand how they're canceling and how they're enforcing a cancellation of Halloween. I, I think, I think, right. Like you're saying, it'd be, you make your recommendation. There's no town official events and then the rest, we just have to leave it up. And I don't see the chief on there anymore. No. And I, but he, he, we chatted about it. Um, no. you know, and I, after the, we voted on it at the board of health, it's just, you know, I don't believe in making, um, recommendations or making quote unquote proclamations that you can't enforce. And unless we're going to have someone running around after the kids, I can't, if you can't enforce it, I, I don't see, you know, I mean, if, if I, I can enforce a store wearing masks i can enforce lots of things but i i can't enforce kids not but like you said turn off your lights right hey, caitlin um, yes sir ju just to go back on on our conversation that we had just a few moments ago with umass yes sir can, can i just um ask that if you or um our health agent steve ball any members of the um um Board of Health, if anybody has any questions or concerns, please don't wait to another meeting to bring them up to Absolutely. Jeff. And and Jeff Jeff has a telephone numbers of everybody that we need to contact, and and we can we can bring to bear the powers that Jeff wields so effectively. His golfing <laughs> his golfing prowess. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Go on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and I, I was very concerned when, when you had, you and you were talking about not being able to, you should be able to contact the people that you need to at UMass immediately. And right. there's, and, and so I, I think that if, if you ever have that not available to you, you let Jeff know and Jeff has telephone numbers of everybody. And, and, uh, and there was an offhanded comment that somebody could have been contacted right away and um, her, her phone calls were not answered. Yeah. And, and I wasn't going to get into an argument and I wasn't going to, you know, put yeah, it out there. Yeah. But that, but that's why, that's why it's very important that you do contact Jeff. Okay. Yes. And, 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 and Jeff, Jeff, Jeff has uh, the resources to get the, to the people that need to be contacted. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys very much for your help. Okay, thanks. Um, and for getting UMass to the table when even me with my big mouth couldn't do it. Go figure. Sorry. Um, so my, my recommendation about uh, Halloween, I know it's not as straightforward as you probably had wanted, but it's just that no town, no town events be held at this point. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay. Thanks. If, Thank if you. All right. Have questions, you can call the Board of Health. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks, guys. Um, we just have two other topics. I believe we can go through here before, because uh, I see Alyssa's on there for our um, 
<clears throat> our hazard mitigation public forum. We're running a few minutes over. You want to do the uh, wastewater treatment plant one next, uh, Jeff? Sure. I see Rich is out there. Thanks for coming. Hey, Rich. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yes, we got you now. Hey, Rich. Yes. You know, it'd be great if you had your backdrop with one of the uh, clarifiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe yeah. some sewer pipe footage. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, actually, actually, we did we did the camera work already, and there's uh, hours of footage I've still got to go through. So, um, but anyway. Uh, nice job, by the way, on the uh, on the grease blockage. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. So Rich, do you want me to introduce this, or do you want to? Um, either either way is fine. Okay, so um, at annual town meeting, uh, there was a capital request to do uh, replace the level control system. I think it um, one of the wet pumps, um, and we got an initial quote. Uh, the capital was approved um, and then the, as we refined the, the quote, it came back a little bit higher. So I think we were just talking about perhaps, um, I think it's less than 10% of the total project cost. And we're hoping that there could be just a transfer from sewer reserve to cover it and allow the project to go forward. Yeah, um, part of the reason that it came in a little higher is the original quote was a miscommunication. Um, did not include prevailing wage. Um, Ooh. Okay. Yeah, due to due to procurement laws, due to the amount of money involved, it had to include prevailing wage. Um, and that that was a that was a good percentage of it. I bet you Jeff can tell you that the. the Prevailing wage needs to be paid from dollar one, right, Jeff? Yeah. Dollar one. Yep. <laughs> That's what you learn when you go to those uh, procurement classes. And how to get the prevailing wage schedule for the area, yep. Yep. Dollar one. Does anybody have any, um, any uh, questions for Rich at all or um, Jeff on that? Do, do you just want to take it so you're not going to take it out of the maintenance of the thing. You just want to. You're just looking at a, a transfer. That's that's what I was thinking because it's capital. Hmm. What do you think, Mr. Scotty? I'm looking at the proposals right now. Is there any work in the scope that can be self-performed to drop down uh, the value? to get inside of the appropriation would be my first question to Rich. Mm. Whether it's demolition or any of that stuff. I, I would prefer that we didn't get involved in it uh, just because if there's any unintended consequences, I wouldn't want Warner Brothers on the hook for any part of the project. I would rather have one vendor handle it, soup the nuts and not involve us in that aspect. Is there any fabrication offsite that can be done that doesn't require prevailing wage? Mm. Possibly I could ask. Pre prefab work does not, is not included in prevailing wage. Correct. So you're looking to get what, essentially $6,000 if I see this right? You want 38, okay, original request was 32. I think there yeah, was um it was about um the difference in quote was about um two thousand mm -hmm. dollars um the only other thing is the vfds that are required um more likely than not will be able to will be able to be reimbursed by the utility company so in that reimbursement is that something that can be that can be deducted from that total if it if it goes addressed. through sure so those two things I would suggest we explore before we, you know, go beyond a transfer. Again, any offsite prefab not required, 
and any reimbursement from Eversource would come off of total project cost. That would help. I mean, if you get, even if you get a couple thousand bucks for the drives, there, there's there's the gap. Yeah, what what we were what we were actually told is somewhere in the two thousand to twenty five hundred dollar range mm -hmm. and the size of the drive. Yep. Because we have two different two different size um, two two different size um, motors. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the project in and of itself lends it lends itself to efficiency, no doubt about that, and reliability. I would hate to miss the opportunity to improve the treatment plant in those two categories over the appropriation process. That said, I think the two things I suggested could be explored and you might be able to be within the appropriation. Okay. All right, any other questions on that topic? All set, Davey, I am. All right, okay, thanks. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, guys. Check that out and maybe we'll get lucky there. <clears throat> All right, and then we've got one other item, uh, our finance update. And I see we've got uh, Brian and a few other folks on there. What uh, what did you want to cover with this one, Jeff? Um, I, I think that, you know, we're, Entering October and well, I guess we're second week in October yeah. now, and we we we're talking about uh, about when we would be letting folks know about the wage adjustments and and colas, and thought at this point we'd have um, the the October first tax deadline in, and and so just sort of checking in and and seeing um, how are there, looking financially and if it's looking like that so we'd be able to implement those wage adjustments in colas or not yep um, so sort of a pulse check if you will right yep all right <clears throat> um did you want to have brian go first or right. sure uh, okay can everybody hear me yep brian. okay um well, as you know last year was a tough year in terms of getting the time necessary to do all of the work required to get the general ledger where it needs to be for recap, free cash certification, and Schedule A. Last year, I was allowed additional time by FERCOG to be able to do all of it. This year, I have been hogtied. I have not been allowed anything over the standard work week to deal with all four towns and training somebody. So it is, that has slowed the process down to begin with. The second biggest factor is, uh, unfortunately, the treasurer's cash book has been problematic getting it to me fully reconciled. And I need it fully reconciled in order to be able to post to the ledger. I never got a fully reconciled cash book until August of this year. And once I get that cash book, I have to go through and cross foot it so that I know that all of the totals columns represent what's over in the activity side of the spreadsheet. And this is a massive cash book. It, column wise, it goes from A to AK. And it can be as many as 300 and some odd lines going down. So it's not a small project every month trying to make sure I've got good numbers to work with. Uh, that said, being hogtied on time and having to do all of that, I'm finally up to the point where I've got April fully reconciled. I've got May to the point where the cash book is crossworded. Now I've got to take the time to go through, see what was originally in the cash book when it was first given to me way back. And I started posting to try to stay ahead of the game, find out what is still in, what has been removed, so that I can then go back to my spreadsheet 
and move, move the items around in order to be able to tie out to the cash book. It takes considerable time to do that. Uh, so it, it's not a process that can be rushed. It's not a process that you can put more shifts in during the fall. It's going to be systematically done in a consistent process. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm working towards. Uh, FERCOG has come up with a solution that they're force feeding me, where they're going to take people, put them into some of the other towns, and stir the pot there. In my mind, that simply kicks the can down the road. It doesn't solve, solve the basic problem, but that's their solution. So in the near future, I should be able to have one person who I'm currently working with side by side anyway, and who has already been doing some entry work with the cash receipts and things like that. She'll be allowed more time to be able to take some of the warrant processing and cash receipts current off of my plate to allow me to be able to go over more on the uh, getting last year finally closed out, getting free cash, recap, Schedule A all done. But it's going to take time. Do we have a? Do you have an estimate as to when the Schedule A and the free cash will be done? At the moment, I don't know because after after cash is reconciled, then we get into receivables. We got to re reconcile the receivables. Otherwise, any variance in receivables is a kick to your free cash. And as Scott knows very well, I pride myself on having very few variances. I'm out to maximize the free cash for my communities. So. Unless you unless you want to tell me to shortcut it, which I would advise against, uh, it's not going to be November. I'm hoping it can be December, but I'm not holding my breath because I've got to see how Burkhardt's solution, and I put that in quotes for a reason. I've got to see how that works because I don't think it's going to free me up that much. I think I'm going to be answering questions for the other towns anyway. Hey, Brian, can anybody hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, sorry, that was my dog. No, um, it's okay. Brian, remember, well, as so everybody knows, um, the reason you didn't get the cash books early enough was because of all the inspector issues that we had. That was the main thing. We just couldn't, they weren't getting me the turnovers like they should have, and they were confusing what to do with the online stuff. So that was one of the major reasons why you didn't get it um, in, a, in a timely manner, let's put it that way. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I wanna back you up 100% on that. That whole permitting program was put in place without vetting it by the finance department. All of a sudden we got stuff we didn't know what to do with. The inspectors didn't know what to do with. It was not rolled out in as smooth a fashion as it should have been. So we got the kinks worked out of that now, at least going forwards. Yes, Excellent. we definitely do. I definitely opened up a whole new account. So they're all going into one account. So there's no confusion anymore. Okay. I say that, let's hope there isn't. Any. Yeah. <laughs> Did, uh, any questions from uh, the rest of the board? <clears throat> Elliot, do you have a question? Almost looked like you did, I wasn't sure. Oh, you're on mute. You can just shake your head no, that's Sorry, all right. I, I mean, I don't, <laughs> that's have, okay. I don't have questions. That's I was, okay. I was thinking as I was taking notes. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so Brian and I will- Sorry, I, okay. go ahead. Well, I, if I'm being prompted, I mean, uh, as far as in the future, the, the the inspectors contracts should be going through a vetting process through our committee. Is that right? Or no, the, what, what happened was the online permitting system was put in place 
before all the unintended consequences had been thought out. Right. And it was put through without vetting it by the finance department. Uh, I know that if I had been apprised of the situation, I would have raised certain questions about how we were going to receive our information. Right. I never heard about it until I think it was January and it had been in place since what, November? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> well, at least we've got that kink worked out. So hopefully we won't have any issues there going forwards at least. Right. All right. Um, all right. So I guess uh, any, any speed you can put on it would be appreciated, you know? Any, Brian, any I will other? work very hard. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah, we'll it. work very hard on it. <clears throat> right, Brian? Thing, it's one of, one of the pieces to our puzzle and everything so that we can figure out what's going on. Trust me, as a former <clears throat> finance committee chair in the town of Amherst, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> everything, is, everything is a little unusual this year as far as timing goes and everything. So it's a little different than usual. All right. Any anything else you want to cover on that topic, Jeff? At all? All set. Nope. All right. Okay. Thanks for um, thanks for coming on, you guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate thanks, the update. Guys. Thank you. All right. Okay. Sorry, we're a little delayed. I'll turn it over to Alyssa, who is here for. We've got our hazard mitigation public forum that we're going to start. Sorry, we're a little late on that tonight. That's okay. Ready to go. Um, Jeff, uh, can you, um, am I able to share my screen? I think so. All right, let me try it. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Um, <clears throat> some of this is going to be um, almost uh, a little bit of a repeat if you attended the Municipal uh, Vulnerability this listening session last month um, because there's a lot of overlap between the hazard mitigation plan update and that process, um, but I'll go into that a little bit. Um, are you all able to hear me okay? I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, I think we can hear you fine, yeah. I, I can okay. hear a little, a little extra noise on there, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, oh, and so I'm, I'm sorry, I should introduce myself. So I'm Alyssa LaRose. I'm a senior planner at FERCOG. Um, I've been working with the Sunderland um, Emergency Preparedness uh, team on updating your hazard mitigation plan, um, which was last completed in 2014. Um, I'll just go to the purpose because the reason for having this plan is kind of two pieces. One is it is a requirement in order to receive um, certain grants from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, so you need to have a, a plan that's updated every five years. Um, but it's also a really useful um, process for communities to go through to just come together and bring together people from different departments and um, boards and committees um, to talk about, um, you know, what are the natural hazards that are um, that the communities look at risk to and what are some of the projects that you can do to minimize um, um, potential um, loss to property, people, loss of business, etc. going forward. Um, so tonight um, I'm just going to go through a brief um, um, overview of what a hazard mitigation plan is and um, some of the information you might find in the plan which is also the town website. Um, we'll review some of the, the key findings from this process and then the goal is to you know take comments um, or questions from anyone who's on the call um, and also there's um, some time over the next couple of weeks for anyone who's interested to review the plan on the town website and um, get their feedback to Jeff Kravitz and his um, contact info will be at the end of the presentation. Um, so like I mentioned, the last plan was done in 2014. Um, and the focus of that planning process was to look at what has happened in the past in terms of storm events, um, flooding, um, things like that. 
Um, and there were prioritized action items created for each hazard. Um, but however, we know that the climate is changing. Um, we're seeing more severe storms, um, um, more kind of fluctuations in temperature, extremes, um, and, and heavier precipitation events. Um, and this is, th these are just um, um, data provided by the state for Franklin County on projections moving forward for things like annual average temperature um, over the next 50 to 100 years, um, temperatures above 90 degrees. So something new this time around is that we talked about extreme, extreme heat um, in this round of planning. We didn't talk about that in the last hazard mitigation plan. Um, and then again, also changes in precipitation, um, especially very high precipitation events where we're getting a lot of precipitation in a short period of time. Um, but also um, periods of extreme kind of dry weather, um, which we experienced this past summer as well as in 2016. Um, and so just thinking about um, how all of this plays into to hazard mitigation planning. Um, and these are just some examples of some recent storms that um, uh, some of these are talked about in the plan that caused damage either to Sunderland or neighboring communities, um, it, it, you know, obviously impacting crops, impacting power, um, power lines. This is the ice storm, um, the tornado in Conway. Um, tornadoes are really hard to to plan and prepare for, but, um, and then Irene, which affected um, the West County area quite a bit. And then this was the drought from 2016. Plan documents a lot of these past events and, any, um, and how Sunderland was impacted. Um, and so kind of what I'm leading to is that this time around, we didn't just look at past events that have happened to figure out the town's risks, but also considered future hazards um, considering climate change. And the types of things that we look at are critical facilities and infrastructure in the town, um, as well as populations. Um, and so this is, um, this is in the plan. It's, it's uh, census data um, estimates on different categories of potentially vulnerable populations that might need extra consideration when planning for um, disasters, um, these categories, uh, people may overlap um, in these, so you don't want to add them up, but um, it just gets, gives you a sense of, um, you know, where there may be some vulnerabilities to address. Um, you know, things like living in a home built prior to 1975, that would be when the state building code went into effect. So homes built prior to that, um, some might be really, um, um, might stand up really well, because um, I know older homes sometimes are actually really um, resilient, um, but others maybe not. And that includes most of the apartment complexes were built prior to that time. Um, so the committee um, considered all these different things and went through a prioritization exercise. Um, and this is kind of, these are the results of them, um, of that exercise. This is used to try to help um, with prioritizing action items um, so that the higher risk um, hazards, action items that address that may, um, um, you know, rise to a higher priority in the action table. Um, and then another key piece of the plan is that after each hazard is discussed, um, there's a set of key problem statements that the committee came up with for that particular hazard. And these are, this isn't all of the problem statements in the plan, but these are ones that especially kind of were repeated often um, for multiple hazards. Um, and so they came up quite often and the goal was to try to then address these in the action plan. Um, so things like, you know, a high water table and the issue with drainage ditches and things like that in the, um, the kind of flat area of town um, came up over and over again. Um, impacts to farms, obviously a concern. 
um, other infrastructure like culverts. Um, um, dam failure is a big risk for the town, even though it's, um, you know, less likely to happen, um, but that's obviously a concern. Um, and communications, emergency communications and shelter um, were some of the other problem statements. <laughs> And then there were definitely actions that were accomplished since the last plan. Um, these fell into some different categories. Um, the regional shelter plan um, was established and has been practiced. Um, Frontier Regional is the regional shelter for Sunderland. Um, there's more to, to do um, with that, but there has been work around that. Um, you have a lot of local regulations in place um, that have been updated over time to really address um, you know, mitigating impacts of new development on things like flooding, erosion, stormwater runoff, and just protecting natural features in town that that serve as your your green infrastructure, or it's you know, um, um, it's it's the natural environment that's helping to um, reduce the negative impacts on the built environment from storms. Um, and then there have been some culverts replaced over time and as well as catch basins and that's ongoing, ongoing work. So I can't put all of the action items into the presentation because there's quite a few, but this is again um, um, on the website in the plan. Um, this table, the action table is towards the end, um, but it's on a by 17 paper and it's big. Um, so I just put some of the, the high priority action items in to give folks a sense of what the different, um, you know, types of actions are that came out of the process. Um, and some of these are carried forward from the last plan as kind of ongoing, or maybe they've been modified and updated some. And then some of them are new um, that came out of this current planning process. Um, and they relate to, um, you know, critical facilities and infrastructure, as well as your local plans and regulations, um, education and outreach, which is often to um, residents or businesses, and then a new category, which is nature-based solutions, where you're using your natural resources to help mitigate uh, damages, again. Um, so these are just some of the, the action items, and these are the highest priority ones. Um, and you'll see there's some related to communication, um, certainly transportation, wildfire, and access to um, the forested areas, as well as water. Um, so I don't know how, I, I don't need to go through all these because I, it's too much, but um, I'm happy to, um, you know, take questions or if there's a question about, you know, is there an action item that addresses something, you know, we can talk about that without you having to go in and read through the whole thing. Um, and this is the link to the plan um, and Jeff's contact information. Um, basically the next steps for this process is to um, finalize the plan over the next couple weeks, um, submit it to the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency for review. Um, once they review it, it has to go to FEMA for review. And once they approve it, then the town votes to adopt it. And then it's, um, it makes you eligible um, for the certain hazard mitigation grants. Alyssa, how long do you, do you think the um, review process is? <laughs> Uh, the statement FEMA would be like just ballpark? Um, they've been really quick lately. Um, so I'm hoping it might be even as quick as just a couple months. Um, okay. Yeah, or even quicker. Um, MEMA has been very quick um, at getting back to us because we're working with a number of Franklin County towns on this. Um, and we've already had quite a few go through the review process. And I think especially even, even with COVID in a way, they're almost being quicker. <laughs> um, okay. <bigger. laughs> um, so yeah, they're being really, really um, great about, um, you know, we've had you revisions to make, but they're often pretty um, 
quick and simple revisions just to address a few um, a few small things and then they're very responsive at, at getting back to us about about that so okay that's good thank you yep <clears throat> Everybody's got the link there. So if you want to go out and take a look at it, does anybody have any questions specifically for Lisa at all? Oh, I do. Is that, I is that do. Jennifer? 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 Hey, how are you? <laughs> I did, I did sort of read it all. Um, and I had a question of if the roads on Mount Toby are referenced at all, or would they be included in roads in general? For in terms of flooding, I've seen uh, after big rain events, little rivers going down those roads, and yep. um, then it, they end up down in people's yards. Limited number of people down downhill, but then the rivers that are near these roads are getting filled with debris and sand and rocks and pieces of the you know chunks of the road. Um, and there was an issue on Dry Brook years ago when that was all, the dam was starting to get clogged up and then logging got added to that and then all the trees and debris came down the river and caused problems for people downriver, but. Um, thank you. I, I believe there's, if members of the committee want to chime in too, I believe there is mention of, of erosion um, uh, in that area of town. Um, but we can double check that and, um, you know, make that in there. Yeah, I know we did talk about it a couple of times. <clears throat> yeah. And um, one and so in, in an action item for that would be to try to address, address erosion on, um, along those roads, which I'm guessing aren't paved. Sounds like they're dirt roads. Right. Uh, okay. I think Chief, Chief Benjamin was going to chime in with something there, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. One of the one of the places where we've addressed that in the plan is uh, access for wildfire fighting and uh, and access to various parts of Mount Toby. I'm, I can't recall if we specific. I'm scrolling through now. I can't recall if we specifically talked about erosion, but maintenance of those roads was very important yep. uh, for that reason. That's right. Yep. Yeah, because inevitably you get a, some calls and you have to go up there and deal with whatever the issue is, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so we can maybe take a look at those the, those action items and see if it makes sense to add in something about um, erosion and just make it clear um, that it's also the dirt roads um, as well as the, the woods roads, if that makes sense. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, we'd probably just have to be careful to identify um, specific actions we could take as the town on town owned roads and yeah. then specific outreach to private landowners because right. some of those roads are, it's kind of a mix of, of public and private roads that are up there and they all impact the watershed. Okay, um, Jeff, you wanted to mention something. You're on mute. Um, in, in previous occurrences, it does note that there were washouts of the fire and access roads on Mount Toby. Um, but we can certainly say that it's going to continue or yeah. with more weather. Especially in like a condition like this year where we've had, you know, a drought condition, it gets very dry and then we get these quick heavy rain events, you know, like the remnants of a tropical storm moving through or something like that. It tends to be more, more likely that that'll happen under conditions like that. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, we could um, put in, if it makes sense, we may just add a separate action item to address it, um, yeah. what the language looks like, but yeah, and there's definitely um, things that um, can be done to help address the upstream, you know, keep more of the, the um, debris from being washed down, downstream. Yep. Okay. Melissa, yes. this is Steve Schneider. I was at, uh, I was at that uh, workshop at the school, and I guess I'm a little surprised reading through the report that it, um, 
the list about what, what parts of the town would be flooded in the 100 year flood um, versus 500 year flood because we've twice in the last uh, 60 years, I guess, or no, I guess more like 80, um, the town has had a lot of the town center flooded. So I'm, I'm just kind of surprised at what's called the 100 year flood area. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and we do note in the plan that FEMA is in the process of updating the 100 year floodplain maps. Um, so it's hard right now to um, make a really good assessment um, until those updated maps are done because yes, you're right, the 100 year floodplain is definitely outdated. Um, um, I believe it was it was either late 70s or early 80s when it would have first come out. Um, and, um, you know, we can just try to make that that clear um, in the in the, that it's expected that, you know, a larger area could be in the floodplain, uh, but that the town's awaiting those new maps. <clears throat> Have they given an ETA on when they would be ready at all? Because I know we've talked about it a few times. Um, it's going to be a few years, I think. I'd have to check in with Kimberly McPhee, who's my boss, um, who's more involved with that process. Okay. So I'm not right. sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And we appreciate all your hard work because I know you've been at this for quite a while. So. Yeah, we had a hiatus because this one was so busy. I mean, all of you folks who were meeting to work on this project obviously had other things to deal with when COVID hit and everything. So um, really it was, it. the committee put a lot of work into this and I'm glad that we were able to come back together to, yep. to um because I know you've all been busy. <laughs> so, Keep it moving, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, please, please be in touch with Jeff, um, and um, and then we'll go from there. All right, thanks. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, next up, we already covered our COVID topics, and um, I would kind of say that the discussion of the benchmarks was sort of covered under our finance update. Unless anybody has any like specific questions on that at all. <clears throat> So we can move down to any um, select board updates if we've got it. Oh, Jeff. Yeah, just, just one something. quick thing. The legislature had another economic round table last week and uh, most of the experts were predicting, um, I think between four and six billion yeah. in lost revenues. Um, there there were, there was one that I noticed that, that I think was, a couple hundred million below benchmarks in fiscal year 21. And then uh, it was like a 1%, 1.3% loss. And then in fiscal year 22, they, and I think this was Barry Bluestone from Northeastern, um, predicted almost a 3% increase in revenue in fiscal year 22. Hmm. I will note that that was okay. definitely the outlier among <laughs> the economic experts, but there was one <laughs> that was yeah. uh, more optimistic. Was that was that the same person who had the much lower estimate? I think. I think that was a different group. There was a, a Tufts model that okay. predicted closer to one, one between one right. and two billion in lost revenue. Okay. So, so the, the jury is still kind of out on that. We're still fluctuating in the same range, but sort of seems to averaging out around like five or so and shortfall, five billion. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> Keep our fingers crossed there. Um, do we have any select board updates at all? Um, Dana Roscoe, are you there? I, I did see him question. earlier. I had a I had a I had a question of Dana's there. Oh, there he is. Dana, when uh, UMass was talking earlier, they talked about Amherst um, noise complaint, hmm. and they talked about if it resulted in a uh, citation. 
Is, that's what you, that's the word they used, right? A citation. I think it was. Yep. Dana, do we have do we have anything in our in our bylaws that would that would trigger UMass notification like that for noise so, bylaws? Right. Our our noise bylaw is enforced by the police, so it's a disturbing the peace bylaw. Okay. So if if if, if something is perceptible within. Uh, Steve is actually our our decibel uh, guy on the board, but if it's if 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 something is perceptible uh, beyond your property bounds, such that it is going to uh, disturb uh, someone, then it is uh, an enforceable uh, issue that you can uh, bring. So the planning board gets involved uh, with like. Uh, Warner Brothers is going to install a piece of equipment, a, yeah. a, you know, a vibrator or something that's going that, that would have the potential, the long term potential. But most of our noise things are, you know, a single event, a, you know, a party or a, or a, a band or some some single event that's annoying people. It's our excessive noise bylaw, right? That we yes. passed a little while back. Yep. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Dana. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Jeff, any um, town administrator updates? Other than all the other stuff. <laughs> uh, it, it's been a busy week, but yeah. uh, I did want to mention that, that um, today we applied for a community compact cabinet IT grant. Um, talked about it briefly last week about applying for the 800 band radios. Um, yeah. I just wanted to give a shout out to Chief Metropolis who put in a lot of work on that and, and got it prepared um, in order to get it in on time. So um, we'll keep our fingers crossed that, that we get a, a favorable uh, result from that. All right, great. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Hey, Chief Benjamin, you out there? Hey, just I about just to, to uh, I just wanted to thank you, uh, your uh, crews. They did an outstanding job uh, last Friday night. Um, I think you had all four trucks out, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I saw them all over the place because I was uh, making a trip down to my daughter's house a few times. Um, but they did a good, uh, better than good, they did a great job. And the other thing is, I just want to let you know, and if you could pass along um, to your crew, uh, Zach, the director from uh, South County, was very appreciative for and, and commented on the professionalism of your guys when they come out. And he made a special, special case of saying the Sunland Department is uh, Top notch, and um, he is very appreciative of the help that that you guys have given him, in the in the in the recent past. So, he just wanted to pass that along to you guys. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate hearing the the kind words, and I'll let everybody know they're out back, and thank you, uh, Steve. I'm going to go join them. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I should just note that Chief Benjamin was also very helpful in preparing that grant too and, and working with um, Chief Metropolis to, to get the number of radios and everything um, order, uh, figured out. So, thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. And do we have any general public comments at all? Since we've reached that point in the evening. All right, I see our next meeting is scheduled for next Monday, October 19th. And um, everybody should be, who's requested them should be getting ballots if you haven't got them already in the mail. So don't forget that. And uh, <clears throat> don't forget that you have to put the ballot, follow the instructions please, but you basically have to put your ballot inside the envelope, which then goes in the outer security envelope. So don't forget the two envelopes out there. And if you do have any questions, um, there's plenty of information on the website and uh, you can also contact our town administrator. So, <clears throat> all right, then uh, if there's nothing else, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. 
All those in favor of adjournment at about uh, 747? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>